Hi, I'm Miriam, and this is Trials and Errors. I've been sitting here for a few minutes um, trying to think about how I was going to start this episode of this show. You know, a lot of times we're thinking, okay, what's topical? What's hot right now? What's trending? What do people want to talk about? What do people want to hear about? But there are some things that we should never stop talking about. One of those things and one of those people is Breonna Taylor. Breonna Taylor was a vibrant human being who didn't deserve to die. She was shot in her own home on March 13th of 2020. The murder of Breonna Taylor and George Floyd and several others led to one of the largest civil rights movements that this country has ever known. It's important that we understand beyond this I this general idea of black bodies not being valued in this country, how our law, how the people involved in executing these laws continue to reinforce this notion that black lives don't matter. What I did was I pulled up Breonna Taylor's search warrant. A search warrant is a tool that is necessary, that is constitutionally required in order to go into a person's home. Because a person's home, their domain, their sacred space, it's their castle. People have the right to be free of the intrusion of the government into that space unless there is probable cause to believe that a crime has been committed. The problem, of course, is that probable cause is a term that has evolved as time goes on. It went from being a standard that was just below beyond a reasonable doubt, which is what needs to be proven in order to get a criminal conviction. We've gotten to the Breonna Taylor search warrant where probable cause just means put some stuff on a piece of paper because a judge will sign off on it. We spent a lot of time talking about the cops in this case and they are absolutely to blame. They were 100% at fault in this case. But that blame is joint and severable. And what that means legally is that there are a whole bunch of people who are 100% responsible for what happened to Breonna Taylor. It starts with judges. And we leave judges out of these conversations because judges have absolute immunity. No matter what a judge does in his official judgy capacity, you can't do a damn thing about it. No matter how awful his decision, how treacherous his decision, how racist his decision. There's nothing you can do. At least in some cases, you can sue a cop. You can't sue a judge. And if there was a judge that needed to be sued, it would have been the judge that signed off on this Breonna Taylor search warrant affidavit. And I wanna go through it because I think it's important for us to understand exactly how the law denigrates black lives. Because if we don't understand it, right? I understand it, but if you don't understand it, how do you fight it? What are you talking about? What is the thing that we want changed? What is the thing that you want changed? So we need to figure out what that is. There are a lot of laws that are talking about not issuing no-knock warrants. Is exactly what it sounds like. It's a warrant where you don't have to knock, right? You just, you have a warrant, you take your battering ram, SWAT comes down and they break in your door and they have flashbangs and that's it. And it's two in the morning and your children are asleep and your dog gets shot or you get shot. And these are also fairly new inventions. And I'm gonna put on my glasses so I can look smart. And the, the PDF to the warrant is linked down below. So if you wanna follow along as we go through this little, you know, law school class lesson, in how you're supposed to get a warrant. So the first page of the warrant basically just talks about who asked for the warrant, the detective's name, and says that there is reasonable and probable cause for the issuance of this search warrant. And it lists the place, which is where Brianna Taylor lived, and it describes it and it's got a picture of it. And then on the second page, it has a it has two vehicles listed, the white Chevy Impala, and the red Dodge Charger. Now the Chevy Impala was Breonna Taylor's, the dark Dodge Charger was not. And it says that they can find drugs in this house and that if they find drugs, they should seize those drugs along with any anything else that would indicate that they're drug dealers. So if they've got a ledger book or notes or anything like that. I sat here with these 
14 very short paragraphs on one page. I've been sitting here saying, is there something I'm missing? Was there something else that, that made this judge think, yeah, there's definitely gonna be drugs found in this house. And let's start at the beginning, okay? There's a poll camera. They found a poll, they set up a poll camera on January 2nd, right? That's a little more than three months, January, February, March, three months before Breonna Taylor was killed. And a poll camera is what it sounds like. It's a camera that they put on top of a telephone pole or a light pole, and it monitors the area around them. They're notoriously grainy, they're pretty crappy, but they're used in high crime areas, and let's make sure that we understand what a high crime area is. It is a place where black people live. Within an, air, within an hour of surveillance at this intersection, there were 15 to 20 vehicles that went to and from 2424 Elliott Avenue within a short period of time, which is indicative of trafficking in narcotics. And it's really important that we realize that it's 2424 Elliott Avenue. Brianna Taylor lives at 3003 Springfield Drive, number four. Okay, so that's not her address. On that same day, detectives observed Adrian Walker going to and from 2424 Elliott Avenue. And he was, as he left, he was speeding. So the cops pulled him over. And when they pulled him over, they smelled a strong odor of marijuana, of course, in an undetermined amount of US currency located in the center console of the listed vehicle. It's undetermined because they didn't search his car. It's undetermined because it was, they didn't want to tell you. It's undetermined because it's $2. Is it $2,000? I mean, what other kind of currency would there be? in the center console of someone's car. So there's a small amount of marijuana and money. They find out that he's got, Mr. Walker has, pending court cases. He has no open warrants, but he's got court that's coming up soon, felon in possession of a firearm, buying, possessing marijuana and drug paraphernalia and cocaine. On the 8th of January, detectives see Jamarcus Glover operating the Dodge Charger and Adrian Walker was a passenger. These guys go in front of 2425 and 2427 Elliott Avenue, drop something off, a blue container, and try to cover it up and leave. I've been reading this and reading this and reading this to see if the cops ever go to find out what it is that they're hiding, and they never do. I mean, it's, it's apparently by a, a pile of rocks in a place that's beyond the curtilage, which means beyond the location or, or the, the line beyond which you would need a search warrant. The cops never, ever, ever go to see what it is that they're dropping off and covering up or picking up at a place that's nowhere near where Breonna Taylor lives. They say that there's a trap house and you know what a trap house is. It's a place where they, it's a stash house. It's where they keep the drugs and that they're re-upping it from this pile in front of this house. The Dodge Charger makes frequent trips to 2424 Elliott Avenue to 3003 Springfield Drive, where Brianna Taylor lives. They say several trips, frequent trips. They don't say when these trips were made, what days, what time of the day, how long they stayed in 3003 Springfield Drive, nothing. No indication at all that either of these two men ever spent the night at 33003 Springfield Drive, went inside and stayed for a few hours. It doesn't say anything about any specifics about these observations. We don't know that the judge asked because there's nothing in the warrant to show us that the judge said, hey, when did this happen? Was it in January? Was it in February? Like, when did you see all of this? And for how long did they stay? And did they stay overnight? Nothing. So I kept reading it and reading it and reading it saying, well, there's gotta be, there's gotta be something. On January 16th, January 16th, two months, before Breonna Taylor is killed. Jamarcus Glover drives up in front of 3003 Springfield Drive. He walks inside the apartment, comes out with a suspected USPS package in his right hand. And then he drives to, then he drives to 2605 West Muhammad Ali Boulevard, which is a known drug house. We don't know how they know it's a drug house. Now, let me get, let me be very clear. The reason why I'm saying this is, this is the stuff that you're supposed to include in a warrant to tell the judge that you have probable cause to break down this door and search the house. We have no idea 
How they know this is a known drug house? Known to whom? Known how? Is it a confidential informant? Have they made their own hand-to-hand -hand transactions? Did they use um, an undercover? Did they, do they have a, a, somebody wired up? How do they know that this is a known drug house? Here's the big one, paragraph number nine, affiant verified through US Postal Inspector that Jamarcus Glover has been receiving packages at 3003 Springfield Drive, number four. Affiant knows through training and experience that it is not uncommon for drug traffickers to receive mail packages at different locations. That's a lie. That's a straight up lie. I mean, a lie lie. And you know what? The judge could have found out it was a lie. If the judge had said, who did you speak to at the postal service? When did you speak to them at the postal service? What exactly did they tell you? How many packages did he get there? We now know that this is a lie, that the detectives never conferred with people at the United States Postal Service. It literally never happened. In fact, after Breonna Taylor was killed, that's when they contacted the Postal Service. And the Postal Service said, no, no suspicious packages were ever delivered for, De for Jamarcus Glover to Breonna Taylor's address. But you know what? The judge could have asked. In fact, as I was reading this warrant, I was surprised at how many glaring omissions there were. Did the judge ask, who did you speak to? at the United States Postal Service. When did you speak to them? What exactly did they say? But see, the judge isn't gonna do that because the judge believes the cops. Judges always believe the cops, even though we have video now knowing that police officers lie. This judge believed that police officer and didn't ask about anything. Not one single thing that we can see because there's no addendum to this search warrant. This is it. He then says that Affiant has observed the above listed white Chevy Impala parked in front of 2424 Elliott Avenue on different occasions. We don't know when those occasions were. We don't know if they were last year, two years ago, last week. There's no, and there's no indication of when, for how long, what was she doing? See, the whole point here is to make it seem like Brianna Taylor is involved in drug dealing. That's it, without any proof at all. There's literally nothing in this warrant to indicate that Brianna Taylor has anything to do with drugs. Then out of the blue, they say on February 20th, we searched some databases and it says that Jamarcus Taylor's address is 3003 Springfield Drive. We don't know what databases. There's no printout attached, there's no screenshot, there's nothing that's on there that, that says. And that's February 20th. And they don't say, well, we sat outside this house and we saw him come out at six in the morning and then we watched him go in at seven at night and not come back out. That would have been easy. They didn't do it. <laughs> what really kills me about this warrant is that the detective says that on January 18th, 2020, they have received information from their crime tips hotline that there has been drug activity going on at 2424 Elliott Avenue. They did a search warrant on December 30th of 2019 and narcotics and firearms are recovered. And then they found out that a week after that warrant on 2424 Elliott Avenue, they saw vehicular traffic going to and from that location. And the judge signed it. He signed it. They asked for, they asked for a no-knock warrant and the judge, the judge signed it. He said, go ahead, go do whatever the fuck you want. I don't care. I don't really know how to tie this whole thing up. I don't know. I don't know how to make people feel what I feel about this. I really, I don't. I don't know how to get people to be angry because search warrants are boring, right? Like they're, you know, the no knock warrant and you know, the militarization of police and all of that is, you know, that's exciting. That's like, you know, you shouldn't have SWAT and you shouldn't have, you know, cops with tanks or, you know, machine guns or any of that stuff, right? But really what we shouldn't have is judges signing off on warrants where there's not a single indication that the person who lives in that house committed any crime ever at all. Where is Breonna Taylor's criminal record in this? They always include the person's criminal record. Where is it? No surveillance of her home, no indication of dates, 
and this judge signed this warrant. And here's the thing, we don't know, and we'll never know, because you can't FOIA court records. We don't know how many of how many warrants like this where people managed to live that judges sign. We don't know. We need to know. We should know. We should find out. The only thing we know is how many wiretap warrants the federal judiciary gives out. And I can tell you, they almost never deny a federal wiretap. I think in the past decade, and Justin can correct me if I'm wrong, they've denied maybe three at the heart of our problem with the criminal justice system. At the heart of it are people who have absolutely no respect for the humans that are involved in it. None. And it starts at the top. It starts with those people in black robes that we stand up for when they walk in the room and we say, Your Honor. Your Honor signed a warrant and really it was Breonna Taylor's death warrant. Who's going to ask him? Why'd you do it? Why didn't you ask any questions? The people that monitor judges couldn't give a crap. I mean, it is almost impossible to get a judge even recused, meaning taken off a case. Forget about losing their job. How many other warrants like this did this judge sign? Who's going to let us know? I hope you stuck with me for this long because I really think that we can't forget Breonna Taylor and we can't only have, you know, a Breonna Taylor's law, which is great. Don't get me wrong. It's, it's fantastic to not have any more no-knock warrants, but we shouldn't have had this warrant in the first place in any way, shape, or form. It should never have been issued. Just keep moving on, right? Just move along. Capital insurrectionists. What, I mean, what good is our democracy if it's not good for everybody?